Today I'm very happy to present a program on Polish biblical history. Um, many might say, how was there ever biblical history or biblical faith in Poland? Well, there was indeed, and it is a surprise to many that there is a heritage in Poland of true biblical faith. And um, I just would like to say personally as we begin this uh, DVD that Poland is very much on my heart. Um, it's very much like my own native Ireland, uh, quite under Roman Catholicism, but with a, a desire in the hearts of some to come to the real knowledge of Christ Jesus in biblical faith. And I was actually invited by many churches in Poland in the year 2000 to visit many uh, Baptist churches and I was looking forward to the visit right across Poland. And then because of false ecumenism, the whole trip was called off. I finished up by visiting Hungary and Slovakia and uh, later on, but I miss Poland in the year 2000 and was a great, great distress to me because I long to speak in churches about the true history of Poland and true biblical faith. I was invited back later on in 2003 to Warsaw, another small city in Poland, but there I met some pastors and they told me how distressed they were that people did not know the history of Poland and they did not know true biblical faith. So today I'm happy to be able to talk about this and to have a Polish man here with me, Peter Samski. So nice to have you, Peter. Thank you, Richard. And uh, Peter is actually uh, from Poland through his parents. Uh, his parents are Polish. He came to uh, England in, or his parents came to England in the 60s and uh, Peter himself not only was here in England, but he came to the Lord in 1991, and that was the big, the big journey in his life was coming to a personal knowledge of Christ Jesus in 1991. Now, as I said at the very beginning, Peter, it might look to people that Poland is totally Roman Catholic and that its history was just Roman Catholic and that the Reformation had bypassed Poland. What is the true story? What are the roots of biblical faith in Poland? Can you explain to our viewer, Peter, just mm. what the roots were? It is true that in Poland, uh, the Roman Catholic Church dominates. And whenever one considers the history of Poland, one sees Catholicism throughout that history. And particularly when you look at when the nation began in 966. That was a time when the ruler, Mieszko I, that Mieszko I, brought a lot of the Slavic tribes together through negotiation, through battle. But particularly in that year, he had the whole nation, as it were, baptized into the, what was then regarded as the Christian faith. He married the Bohemian princess, Dombrovka or Dubrovka. And at that point, that was quite a monumental um, time. And then within a hundred years or so, uh, that nation of Poland was recognized by the emperor as an actual uh, realm, a kingdom. Prior to that, it hadn't been recognized. And then it really, at that point, it began to adopt the Roman rites of the church that was then in Germany. And from that period on, the Roman Catholic faith began to um, show its dominance. However, it's not true to say that the Roman Catholic Church was the only religion or the only faith in Poland. Um, the problem we face today is that there are many, um, many sources now that have been destroyed or vanished to tell us what happened. But we can still gather a, th a few things. 
And one of the things that's interesting, when I was looking into the history, um, I came across a quote by the historical writer Adam Zamoyski, and he observed, and let me quote here, throughout the late Middle Ages, the Kingdom of Poland-Lithuania was only nominally a daughter of Rome. And in that time, even before the Reformation began to sweep through Europe, there were other movements. There were the Valdenses, and there were also the Hussites, um, who um, began from Jan Hus. And um, so there was that um, influence within Poland. And the Polish historian, Andrzej Węgierski, even speaks about a time when the um, Valdenses were within Poland, within the 12th and 13th century, very near uh, Kraków. Um, but the, the problem is, is that it's very hard at times to, to find these sources because many of these sources have gone. But let me just um, give you a quote from the Polish historian Valerian Krasinski. It's very interesting what he has to say. And he's speaking of the Reformation. These doctrines, the Reformation doctrines, were professed by the most eminent nobles of the land. They were discussed by frequent and numerous synods, and the churches where they were preached, the schools where they were taught, as well as the presses devoted to their propagation, flourished over all Poland in great numbers. Yes, uh, many people have no idea of that history of the many numbers who really knew biblical faith back then and while nominally we had a daughter of Rome the whole heart was the biblical gospel message. Can you go on now to continue to paint the history of true faith in Poland? Peter? Yes, in that period prior to the 16th century, in that period between the 12th and, and the 14th century um, there were, for example, the group the Valdenses or the Vadwa. Now these were biblical people. These were people that held to the Word of God. And the Word of God, the Bible, was their rule of life. Some of them even were able to memorize the whole Bible. And as well as um, holding to the authority of the Bible, they eschewed things such as purgatory and prayers for the dead. For them, when somebody died, there were only two ways, the way to hell or the way to heaven. There was no other way. And the, this group of people um, were throughout Poland and showed that influence in various areas. I've already mentioned that um, near Kraków itself, um, that historian Węgierski speaks of a settlement of Valdenses. But not only the Valdenses, but there are also the Hussites. Now the Hussites um, come from the neighboring land of Bohemia. And Bohemia and Poland throughout history have been very intimately connected. Jan Hus, he was a preacher in Prague. And he came to see many errors in the Church of Rome. And that was through reading God's word and also he was influenced by the writings of the English reformer, John Wycliffe. Now what's very interesting is many of the Polish youth went to Bohemia to study. And when they went to study, they began to hear this teaching. And they then took this teaching back to Poland. And it's interesting that one of the very first martyrs of the followers of, of Hus, um, who, was, who lost his life because the Roman Catholic Church took it, was a Pole by the name of Stanisław Pazek. And he had spoken up against indulgences um, that were being taught in Prague. And because of that, he was condemned to death. What's also interesting is, is that the Polish king, Władysław II, uh, also had connections with Bohemia. He actually had correspondence with Jan Hus himself. And he invited Jerome of Prague to come and to reorganize the University of Kraków. 
Now this was quite significant because Jerome of Prague was not Catholic, but he was what you would recall, regard as a Hussite. He was a man who held to the word of God. And Jerome was able to go throughout Poland and Lithuania and um, speak of God's word, spread the gospel, and many people came under that influence. What's very interesting, and this is just something that I had come across recently through studying this period, was that at the Council of Constance in 1415, when that reformer Jan Hus um, was condemned to death by the Roman Catholic Church for preaching the truth, it was a Polish delegation that defended him and it was through their outcry that he was allowed to speak and Hus himself in his letters acknowledges this. So that influence of the Hussite movement spread throughout Poland and let me just very briefly give you two quotes from two prominent Poles. One is Andrzej Dobszynski and he was at the University of Kraków. He was a professor of theology, and he said this about the English reformer John Wycliffe. Wycliffe speaks the truth. Heathendom and Christendom have never had a greater man than he and never will. This was a man who was acknowledging somebody who had been condemned um, by the Roman Catholic Church. And then we have this remarkable um, statement from a gentleman by the name of Bernard, Bernard of Lublin. And in one of his works, which he published uh, in Krakow, he said this, we must believe the scriptures alone and reject human ordinances. And so it would seem that in Poland, the way was open for the Reformation. Yeah, that is most interesting, and I'm sure for you, the viewer, it is most interesting to know that there was true biblical faith way before the Reformation in the very strong line of the Vaudois, uh, later on they were called Waldenses, these biblical Christians who from earliest times had biblical faith and they had spread biblical faith in many parts of Europe and uh, had it come as far as Poland where they really stood on the biblical gospel. It is very warm and close to my own heart and I've made a whole DVD on the early church where I've spoken at length about the Vaudois but it's lovely to see their influence also in Poland and Jean Hus is also dear to my heart and uh, I've spoken about him also before but uh, and we will be speaking more as we will do another interview regarding Slovakia and the Czech Republic, which is really what Bohemia was in the past, is really what we call modern uh, Slovakia and the Czech Republic now. And to know of the biblical faith of the Hussites, going back to Jean Hus, who was burned at the stake, as Peter has told us, at the horrific Council of Constance, and the stand that the Poles made to defend him at that council. That is just a joy to hear. And then we come up, Peter, to the Reformation. Mm. Uh, this is the faith before the Reformation. How did the Reformation actually come into Poland in the 16th century? Okay. Well, the king of Poland at the beginning of the 16th century was King Zygmunt I, Stary, the Old. And his wife was uh, Bonasfoja of Milan, and she was very enthusiastic about the Renaissance and the growth of culture. And in that period, the Renaissance and the Reformation itself flourished because it was a time of ideas. It was a time when people were able to um, pick up books and read them and explore and pick up the Bible itself. Now, in that period, we could say that the Reformation came into Poland by three streams. In 1518, just a year after Martin Luther had nailed his 95 Theses to the castle church door in Wittenberg, another Dominican monk by the name of Jacob Nade in Polish Prussia in Gdansk also threw out a challenge 
to the Roman Catholic Church. In Gdansk, this Dominican monk threw off his habit, took a wife, and began to preach openly against the Roman Catholic Church. Now, this was remarkable. Well, he was soon imprisoned, but in time he was freed, but he had to leave Gdansk. He then went to Torun, and there he continued his preaching. What happened in Gdansk? Well, in Gdansk, other people began to preach the truth of God's word. The seeds had been sown, the gospel was being preached. Other men stood up and were being prepared to be countered. And so the gospel seed was then being spread. People were hearing the word of God. And throughout that area in Polish Prussia, people were coming to know the Saviour. In towns such as Torun, in Elblong, and also in Bra Vieno, um, these people were coming to know God's word. And really, it was quite a remarkable thing. Can you explain some of the other streams beside this wonderful stream that you've just mentioned of, of the Reformation coming into Poland? Yes. Well, that stream in Polish Prussia would be regarded as the Lutheran stream because many of those men were influenced by Luther's teaching. But another stream was what would be regarded as the Calvinist or Helvetian stream because people were beginning to be influenced by the teachings of John Calvin and Ulrich Zwingli. Now, in particular, in Kraków, a secret society came together, and these were intellectuals, these were ac academic people. One of the foremost of them was Francis Lismanini. He was the Queen's confessor. And what he would do, he would put before other men the teachings of the reform reformers. This what would be regarded as a new teaching, but it wasn't really new teaching. It was simply teaching where people were returning to God's word. Other men there, and men who were very highly esteemed in Polish culture, people such as Jan Czeczewski and his son Andrzej Czeczewski, also other men such as Andrzej Modzewski and also Jan Uhansky. And under that influence of these men who were coming into these truths, other people, other men became bolder in, the, in preaching these truths, particular ministers in the Roman Catholic Church. One preacher, for example, of the Cathedral Church at Kraków publicly denounced idolatry and he actually urged people to read the Gospels. Now this also was quite remarkable because people were kept from reading the Bible. It was only the priest that was allowed to interpret. However, this man was telling people, read the Bible, read the Gospels. Another man, Felix Krusiger of Szczepin, also near Kraków, began to expound the true Gospel. And another man, um, if I can just I have his name here, Jacobus Silvius. He was the first to entirely leave the Mass out, something which is at the very heart of the Roman Catholic Church. Let me just briefly mention one or two other people. And for students of Polish history, these names will be familiar. These were the Schlachter, the noblemen of Poland, and these were people who were openly confessing the gospel. Men such as Severin Bonner, Justice Decius, Mikołaj Oleśnicki, Marcin Sparowski, Stanisław Czikowski, Jan Firle, and also Mikołaj Rey. Mikołaj Rey, he is the father of Polish literature. He is the one who first began writing in the Polish language. This is a a um, monumental figure in Polish culture, and this was somebody who turned to the Reformation truth, who turned to the Gospel, and who then founded many churches, and also appealed for the Bible to be translated, so that even the peasants could pick up God's Word and read it. That is so, so interesting that uh, we have this 
really st st staunch stand of these noblemen, and it is it is a it is a particular facet of of Polish history is that noblemen who had a position in the political world at the time were able to protect the ordinary believers so that the biblical faith could spread across Poland. And this is remarkable because it was not uh, common in other, in mm -hmm. other um, countries at the time. And these noblemen were truly scholars as well yes. as being noblemen. And they knew the Lord themselves. And this is uh, just remarkable. And mm -hmm. I'm, it's so encouraging to our heart to know of these noblemen and the stand that they mm -hmm. made and how utterly Polish this was. Now there was a another stream coming in, uh, a, a later form of what we spoke about already. We spoke about Jean Hus, but mm -hmm. the Hussites continued afterwards as a very strong force from Bohemia, as I said, which would be modern day the Czech Republic and yes. Slovakia from the Bohemian area. There was this influence coming into Poland. Can you explain some more detail about that, Peter? That's right. 1548 is quite a significant year because it, that is when the Emperor Ferdinand became the king of Bohemia and that is when persecution began, particularly for that group what was known as the Bohemian Brethren. These were the spiritual heirs of the Hussites and so many of them fled from Bohemia and a group of them, a significant group, found itself in Poznan in northwest Poland and these Bohemian brethren were welcomed by the Castellan, the governor of Poznan, a man by the name of Andrzej Gurka, a significant man, high-ranking man, wealthy man and he welcomed them in because he had embraced the reformed truths and through his protection and influence and through the preaching of the gospel by these Bohemians, many, many churches were founded. And it's through them that the first true Reformed churches, biblical churches, it would seem, began in Grand Poland. And so he allowed them in his estates in places such as Shamatui, Kurnik and Kosmin. And so it really is quite wonderful, Richard, when you look at history and how the Reformation came into Poland, particularly through these three streams, from Germany, from Switzerland, and from Bohemia. And through these influences, many people were freed from the shackles of the Roman Catholic Church. But not only that, but freed from the shackles of sin and people found freedom in Christ. It is interesting that you speak about uh, Poznan. I hope I pronounced the Polish name correctly there because I know that is very much on your own heart. Mm. I read your, your messages that you send out on the internet uh, and I know that you visit there personally. Uh, if I go to Poland any day, it's one of the cities that I hope to deal to go to and I you were giving me greetings today from a pastor there in Poznan and I would really hope to to go there and I know that many people in Poznan are really coming back to their biblical faith and not only understanding it intellectually but really knowing the Lord so uh, anybody there in Poznan send greetings to you and uh, just trust that we would see more and more cities like Poznan rising up right across Poland where people not only intellectually understand the true history of Poland but really come to that personal knowledge of mm -hmm. faith that these great men had, the noble men and the different believers right across Poland in those early days and then coming up into the Reformation days. Now there's something really different. I have a uh, DVD on the Inquisition which speaks about the horrific torture and the burning of heretics at the stake for 605 years. Now Poland was different. Poland mm -hmm. did not have this horrific persecution and the, the torture and the um, 
the condemning to death and people burning at the stake. Why was it, Peter, exactly why was Poland so different than mm. other uh, neighboring nations where the, the, uh, the paper machine, as it were, tortured and put people to mm. death? Over uh, 50 million we have documented, and that is not said just uh, off, um, you know, off the cuff, as it were, without, we have historical records of 50 million people dying mm. across Europe in those 605 years. Horrific torture mm. and death. And in Poland, we don't have it. Why was that, Peter? Well, it is quite remarkable, Richard. It really is. Whilst thousands were being burnt at the stake in many other countries in Europe, where the Roman Catholic Church exerted its dominance. In Poland, there was none of that. And actually, Poland became known as the land without stakes, the land where there was no burning, as it were. And you could possibly put it down to at least two things. One of them is, is that Poland was really known as a land of liberty because the noblemen, the schlachter, as it were, were men that had much power in Poland. They gave their allegiance to the king, but they also had many privileges. And it was only through the same, the parliament of Poland, that the schlachter's privileges could be taken away. So the king himself couldn't take away their privileges. The Roman Catholic Church couldn't take away, away their privileges. And these noblemen, these schlachter, many were coming to the faith. Many were coming under the gospel and trusting in Christ. And in turn, they were protecting the reformers. Another factor is, is the, the two kings, King Zygmunt I and King Zygmunt II. Both were very tolerant kings, particularly the second one. And what's quite interesting is King Zygmunt II had correspondence with John Calvin. He'd read his Institutes and he was very open to what the Reformation taught. One of his secretaries, Andrzej Mojewski, also proposed reform and very interesting things that Mojewski said. Let me just quote to you just one of the things that Mojewski said. The word of God must be placed above the church and above all authority that has been created. The scriptures should be explained by the scriptures themselves. The places whose meaning is uncertain should be explained by such passages, the sense of which is clear and certain. Now this is quite wonderful. This man had understood the authority of God's word and what it meant to study God's word. Now another prominent man within Poland was the reformer John Alasco or Jan Waski. Now this was a man who was very high up in the Roman Catholic Church, but he turned his back on that to the Reformation, to the truths of the Bible. And his heart was to reform the church. And he did all he could through preaching, through publishing books, through holding synods. Also, he was instrumental in a translation of the Bible so that people could read it for themselves. Sadly, Waski died in 1560. He couldn't fulfill his heart's desire. But what is significant about this period, Richard, is, is the impact that the Reformation truths made on society. The impact, because at the heart of the Reformation was the Word of God. And because the Word of God was so important, the Reformers wanted people to read it. And so they founded many schools. The young were encouraged to read the Word of God. And so many young people were being educated. This had an impact on the culture, the art, the literature. People were investigating, were coming into new things. The reformers themselves fought for freedom in society, fought for the rights of the peasants as well. 
because these men had been changed. God had come and changed their hearts. And so in this period, during the period particularly of, of King Zygmunt II, you see this golden age. And it, it, it's no surprise that during that period, it was re referred to as the golden age of Poland. And the roots of that golden age can be found, I believe, in the Reformation. Yes, it's, it's great that you mention uh, Jean Laske because uh, he is the major figure, just as we had in Germany, Martin Luther, we are Jean Hus mm. in Bohemia, and uh, we have this Polish man that made such a strong stand. Mm. Um, we will be happy to put in some paintings from the time mm. so that people can see what these men looked like from people who knew them and paintings we had at the time. So we, these were real men who made a real stand. Now it, uh, it is quite difficult to say what happened because mm. we had the Reformation coming in on top of what had been biblical faith before that mm. with the uh, Vaudois, the Waldenses, and the living of the biblical faith right across Poland. We had the stream that came from Jean Hus early on, mm. continued later on in the history of Poland. Mm. And then we had the, the noblemen making such a strong stand for biblical faith, true believers right mm. across Poland, standing for biblical truth. And then this major figure Mm. at the time of the Reformation, Jean Lasky. Um, it is interesting, you'll be talking at the end, we have a web page, is the Jean Lasky... Uh, the, the John Lasky Trust Fund, which we hope will soon yeah, be... Yeah, the web page will be, we will give that at the foot of the screen uh, towards the end of this DVD, whereby we would hope to have that web page up and going soon. But this is a man that is significant and it, the whole history before him is quite mm. significant. How was there a turnaround? It was the same right across um, Europe. The Jesuits were the main force to bring down the Reformation. The uh, Ignatius of Loyola, mm. who had been wounded in battle uh, and uh, recovered from wounds that appeared to be mortal, but they weren't mortal, he did not lose his life. And in the suffering that he underwent, he dedicated himself to the Catholic Church and to all that it stood for in its sacraments. And he was the one who founded the Jesuit order. And with the explicit purpose of bringing down the faith of Reformation and the five principles that have been discovered right across mm. Europe besides Poland that salvation is based on the scripture alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ Jesus alone and to God only be the glory. These were the five strong biblical principles that they had in Poland and right across Europe. Now the Jesuit uh, Ignatius of Loyola was intent to bring this down and he was to bring it down by bringing people back to the Catholic Church by education of youth, by founding of colleges for youth and by founding of universities and by personal uh, outreach to kings and to princes in the political realm. And it is really sad to see the influence that uh, Ignatius of Loyola had. It is uh, frightening to see the uh, great work, not only in Poland, but in other nations of the world, where this one man in starting of the Jesuit uh, order, and what was called the Counter-Reformation. It was against the Reformation and biblical faith and it was set up in Poland as it was in other nations. And so we, we see the um, arrival of sacramentalism coming back or coming in 
big time into Poland because before this we had uh, Romanism, but it was like a, a it was a, a lesser form of Romanism. It was really a heart for biblical faith early on, as you gave the very earliest history of the nation, and Romanism had not really been established, but. Ignatius was intent not only across where he knew from Spain and other nations, Italy, he was not intent, his sites were also in Poland, where he was to send out the Jesuits to bring down biblical faith. And it is really sad because I have studied uh, particularly Ignatius and in, in other history talks that we have given to show how they came against a biblical faith. They came against it by bringing people into rituals, sacramentalism, and by bringing people into a mystical experience. Uh, Ignatius had a famous retreat where he was to encounter uh, God directly uh, by a, a different means by which you would fast, you would discipline yourself, you would go into a solitary prayer, uh, for many days, uh, sometimes up to 40 days, and you would try to have a mystical union with Christ. It is really sad to see at the present day so many churches like the Emerging Church who have, uh, who have their connection with Rome, particularly through Ignatius of Loyola and the Ignatian Way. One of the former leaders of the Emerging Church, Tony Jones, who had to resign because of immorality, he actually mentioned the Ignatian way. You know, a so-called evangelical mentioning the way of, um, of Ignatius of Loyola. So I would like you as a poll, Peter, to explain something of the Jesuit influence mm. in precious Poland that had yes. such a a biblical history. Can you explain just how the the tentacles yes. of of Jesuitry reached mm. Poland? Well, I've always um, wondered why Poland has really a tragic history in the last five hundred years. And through my study, I have to come back to the Reformation and to its subsequent downfall and the rise of Roman Catholicism. Really, in summary, when the Reformation fell, Poland fell. And as you've been saying, Richard, speaking about the Jesuits, they were the, one of the instrumental causes. There were other, other factors within the Reformation itself, but the principal cause, it would seem, was the Jesuit order. Cardinal Stanisław Hosiusz, the Polish um, priest, invited the Jesuits into Poland. He saw what the Reformation was doing. He saw the influence of the Roman Catholic Church dwindling. And so he called these men in from Rome, some from Germany, and as you said, you use those words, the tentacles, they were, as, if, as, it, as it were, tentacles slowly um, spreading themselves throughout Poland, the influence of the Jesuit order. They would go into the homes of the Schlachter and the peasant alike. They would found new schools. They would teach in the universities. And it was a very uh, new approach from the approach that was seen in many other places in Europe. Let me just quote to you the Polish Jesuit, Piotr Skarga, and these are his words. He said that the country would be reconquered for Rome, not by force or with steel, but by virtuous example, teaching, discussion, gentle intercourse, and persuasion. You see, this was on the surface. It was through gentle discourse, through, through that subtle approach, but behind it all was a deception. And very soon the fire and sword would come. And so people were being influenced, the young were being influenced, they were being invited to the new colleges that the Jesuits set up. They were being indoctrinated into the Roman Catholic faith. 
the Jesuits themselves would send preachers round the villages. They would um, show so-called relics that would uh, perform miracles. They would hold plays that would lift up the lives of so-called saints. And slowly but surely, the people were being won over to the Roman Catholic Church, not by the gospel, not by the truth that in Christ alone salvation is found, but it was a trust in this system of the Roman Catholic faith. And the more the Jesuits spoke about um, their teachings, the more they attacked the reformers, they repeated time after time through open uh, proclamation, through whisperings, through um, humorous verse, they began to repeat and repeat, and the more the people heard these things, the more the people became under the influence. And so people themselves began to move over to the Roman Catholic Church. The Jesuits were very clever, they were very subtle. They began to ingratiate themselves into the homes of the Schlachter, these noblemen that once defended the reformers. They began to win them over with, with um, sweet words. And really it's tragic what began to happen in Poland. Piotr Skarga himself became the confessor to King Zygmunt III Vasa, and he then became the chaplain of the same, the parliament. If you can imagine the influence that this one man had, and slowly but surely, the laws of the country, this once free, this once intelligent nation, which had laws that upheld freedom, those laws began to disappear. New laws became into view, laws that would suppress freedom of religion. And this all came from the Roman Catholic Church. This wonderful country, this country that had known a golden age, began to fall. People no longer had the freedom to read the Word of God. No longer did they see the truths of the Gospel. No longer were they free from sin. And you see, when the mind is shackled and imprisoned by a system, by a dominance of, a, of, a, of, this, of the Jesuits and of the Roman Catholic Church, the mind is no longer free to explore, to consider new things. And the whole nation itself, in its culture, in its politics, began to fall. You know, within 100 years, this nation was torn apart by civil strife. And then two, within 200 years, it was taken off the map of Europe because it was so weak. Many people, many people did not come then to the truths of the gospel. And when the gospel was hidden, then the Reformation itself fell, and with it the nation itself. And it is so tragic. And what is needed for Poland today is a new spiritual reformation. A spiritual reformation where the word of God is lifted up, and where people turn to the Bible, and not only turn to the Bible, but turn to the one true Saviour, Jesus Christ. It's only through Christ that there is transformation. When one individual is transformed, then there is hope for society, because then there is hope that that society may be transformed, because the Gospel is preached. And what we need today, what we need throughout the world, not just in Poland, is for a biblical view, for people to recognise what the Bible says. The world lies in wickedness. That's what the Bible says. We need to recognise that. And we need to recognise that about ourselves individually. That we are sinners. That we have sinned personally. That through our own lives and also through being children of Adam, we have that original sin within us. And sin 
Sin against God, an infinite God, an eternal God, has eternal significance. And the only hope for us then is within the gospel, the good news. That tells us not to look to ourselves, not to look to a system, not to look to rituals, to tradition, to charismatic experiences, mystical experiences. It's to look to God himself, to put all your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's only Christ that can deal with our sin. It's only through what Christ has done. If we look to him, then his righteousness is credited to us. And in him, we are safe. In him, we are transformed. In him, we have life. And so I say to you, if, particularly if you are Polish, or if you're in the Roman Catholic Church, that you would hear the words of God and live. Praise God. And it is wonderful that we do have, in Poland itself, people turning to the Lord and coming to biblical faith. It's always a, a joy to my heart when I hear from Poland. We have a Polish webpage and we will give the address of our Polish webpage at the foot of your screen. And it is always a joy when we get emails from Poland and people telling us of them coming to biblical faith. I've had the privilege of um, compiling a book called Far From Rome, Near to God, the Testimonies of 50 Converted Catholic Priests. And Poland has been one of the countries where the book has sold better than any place else. Our first 3,000 copies of the book, uh, it was back in about 1996, 97, where the 3,000 copies sold in about three months. And we came out with a second edition of the same first edition of the book. And then we came out with a second edition, and that is selling very well too. And we have on our webpage some of those testimonies of former priests, and you can read them for yourself. It is just wonderful when you hear, I had heard from a, a priest as he was convicted uh, and he had emailed me in Polish and of course I got it translated and, and then I got my reply from English translated back into Polish and he truly had been convicted that he was a sinner before God who is all holy and came to biblical faith. It was just a joy to me to hear from him and another man who was about to be ordained we got an email from him that he had come to biblical faith and individuals who've come to faith it is uh, wonderful to get Polish emails and it's always a joy to my heart the word of God is going forth and that golden age is uh, coming into people's lives mm. as they realize the true heritage of Poland is a personal relationship with Christ Jesus and I would really urge you, the viewer, to know the joy unspeakable and full of glory that it is to know Christ Jesus personally and to come into what is truly biblical faith for a Pole and to make a stand there. We have just about six minutes left, Peter. Mm -hmm. Can you give your summary of your message to a Pole that mm -hmm. you would wish to say in this regard? Okay, really just to um, encapsulate everything that we've, we've been saying just, just now and in regard to the history of Poland, that if we're to study um, that history, we will see that the Word of God had an impact, a real impact on people's lives. And it is that which transformed Poland, just a window in time, that golden age, men and women, children were being transformed and it had such an impact on society. And I would just urge, if you are a fellow Pole, to consider these things. If you're in the Roman Catholic Church, just to consider the true history of Poland, to see that the truths of God's word were being taught in, in Poland, apart from the Roman Catholic Church, People had come to the gospel. People had acknowledged their sin. They didn't look to a priest. They didn't look to any bishop or pope. 
they looked to the only one that was able to save them, the Lord Jesus Christ. Many people came to an end of themselves and came to that one place, that one place, that one person that could deal with their sin. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And salvation is only by grace. It is all of God. It is all that God has done in the Lord Jesus Christ. Many people heard these truths, reformers throughout Poland, great men and small men, as it were, preached these truths. And many people were being transformed. And I would just urge, urge you, if you are listening to us, watching this, that you would consider these things, that you would pick up God's word, consider what it says in God's word. It tells us in the Bible, it is by grace, through faith and not of yourselves. It's not through works that we would boast. It is only through the grace of God working in an individual, causing them to put all their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's just with him, just with him that you can find salvation and he can transform you. He can turn you around and you can be a new person. And so really that is what I would just urge anyone that is listening that doesn't know Christ yet, or who is considering these things, that they would look to Christ, look to what God's word is saying. And really I say this from my heart, from somebody who once was within the Roman Catholic system. I was somebody who was seeking to live by the rules, by the traditions. When I was quite young, I even wanted to be a priest because I thought through what I could do, I could be saved. But I recognized it's only through what Christ has done. It's faith alone in Christ alone that one can be saved, justified, made right with God. And so I really just say that from my heart that you would consider these things, hear the word of God and live. There are websites that you can access and where you can personally get in contact with Richard or um, myself and these will be shown on the screen but the first website is www.bereanbeacon.org and the second website, which we hope will be up and running soon, is www.johnlaskytrustfund, all one word, dot org. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Well, praise God. And thank you so much, Peter. This has been a joy to go over what is the true heritage of Poland and to say that it's no church that saves us, the glorious person of Christ Jesus. The Apostle Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God mm. unto salvation. This is God's power. Grace is identified with power. It is amazing at the very beginning of Polish history, the power of Christ that was seen, and the power that was seen with the Valdwa and the Waldenses and with the Bohemians as they came in and with John Lasky and others, the power of God. Now it is the power of God that we look to and it is God's power to save and there may be few in different cities and towns but God's power is his power and it transforms people individually and then society and that is our hope and our joy to know that God's power will be seen. A wonderful verse that really encourages me in uh, Romans 5 where it says where sin has abound, abounded, grace did much more abound mm. through faith in the righteousness of Christ Jesus mm. that we would reign in righteousness by Jesus Christ. The very last verse in that Romans 5. That is my prayer in my heart for Poland, that there would be a real resurgence of the biblical mm. faith that was the true, that is the true heritage of 
Poland. And I thank you, Peter, for sharing these glorious uh, thoughts on the history of Poland. And I thank you, viewer, for watching. And may the Lord be magnified and many souls saved to the praise of the glory of his grace. Amen and amen. Praise God. Thank you.